It's my pleasure to welcome you all to part one of the global webinar on racial violence and colonial accountability, sponsored and made possible by the New School for Social Research in New York, organized by myself and the filmmaker Rob Lemkin, who you'll hear from soon. My name is Anne Laura Stoller, University Professor of Anthropology and Historical Studies at the New School for Social Research. Today is part one of a three-part series that speaks to the durability of racialized and colonial violations of the past and the urgencies of confronting their effects today. We're honored to open the series with a disturbing but compelling film, African Apocalypse, by the filmmaker Rob Lemkin with his collaborator and film protagonist, Femi Nylander. African Apocalypse, as those of you who have viewed it on the Vimeo site that we made available, is a searing colonial history of the present in its visual and verbal form. It tells the story of the violent French colonial invasion of Niger in 1899 and Femi's encounters as an Oxford student with Nigerians who have lived with its effects. While the subject of numerous reviews and awards, that's not why it figures so prominently in our webinar today. Our choice is pointed. This occasion will be the first public airing of the claims made yesterday by the UN Special Rapporteur, Bebian Salvioli, who is with us today, thank you, on the promotion of truth and justice and was given to the UN's assembly, the General Assembly in New York. African Apocalypse and its Nigerian co contributors form part of the evidence. The cast of speakers includes Felwin Saar, noted co-author of the commission report to the French President Macron on the return of stolen and appropriated African art. Christina Alidou with us also at the moment, leading Nigeri Nigerian scholar of Muslim women in Africa, filmmaker Rob Lemkin, and Femi Nylander. Sean Jacobs, hello Sean, of the New School, a specialist on African film. And most importantly, if the technology allows us, we're working on it as we speak, um, those House of C Citizens who have fought to have these claims made public and insisted that they be presented as extreme colonial violations of human rights. We'll show some short clips um, which form the background evidence to Fabien Sabioli's report. And some of the material, excitingly, is new and not in the end of the film. I begin with, or take the liberty of reading out loud what one might take as a call to arms that is my own. Colonialism stamp themselves into bodies, into minds, in the creases of skin, in the pores of flesh. Simone Weil and Franz Fanon have insisted those who imagine having escaped this inscription fool themselves. This is especially true of the well-meaning good-hearted among us who never wanted them to be colonized, but profited and continue to profit nonetheless. As beneficiaries, subsidizing extractions hailed as development is a stock and trade of the well-meaning, a set of practices renewed at every turn. Philanthropy and humanitarianism are the goods parlayed in the process of feeling good about feeling bad. While the well-intentioned in their silence endorse those ongoing histories of the present. Camps of containment, forests destroyed for mega plantations, gated corporate funded compounds, and ever more lethal tactics to render sensitive quarters and white enclaves more secure and safe. Imperial formations are racial emporia stocked with commodities and currencies of inequality and infrastructures that are unevenly distributed, resources that are generously allotted to some meted out eagerly, if at all to others. 
Imperial designs are drawn with measures of cultural capital that are both white defined and white infested, assuring blocked and privileged access. Those physically and psychically damaged by imperial democracies occasionally have their privations acknowledged but left materially unaddressed. Those others not counted among the counted are subject to forms of enduring duress. Family histories strewn with colonial violences. Among many of them, presidential apologies are strategically lit upon while the colonial present is willfully ignored. In this webinar, we do more though than acknowledge these violences and their enduring effects. This forum is devoted to a specific set of questions we seek to address. Namely, what is to be done about the pervasive situation? What kind of sustaining work does it entail? And what are the multiple sites and supports that will offer not abstract redemption, as did Macron in France or Trudeau in Canada, but work to substantially improve the lives and possibilities of those most affected. In that effort, we bring together those whose agency in demanding reparation and restitution is fierce and hard to ignore. In this effort, we ask about the difference, and this is an important one for us, between the feasible interventions and ideal but unrealized ones. And we ask whether ideal resolutions, despite the obstacles, must be maintained within the visionary landscapes of redress. I pass you to Sean Jacobs presiding over the ensuing discussion, followed by audience interventions and queries, which we very much welcome. Again, thank you all for being here. Sean, please. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Anne. Uh, welcome, ag uh, welcome again, everyone. My name is Sean Jacobs. Um, I'm an associate professor of international affairs here at the New School. As Anne Stoller reminded us, this discussion marks two events. The first report of the UN Special, Special Rapporteur on the legacies of colonial crimes, and second, the film African Apocalypse. The film focuses on France's violent colonial legacy in Niger. Both the film and the report are worth seeing and reading, and I would encourage people to do so. So we have a full program for the next hour and a half, and my job is simple to steer us through the various transitions and keep order and time. We're doing this remotely, so bear with our glitches. One last thing, if you registered for the event before today, you should have had time to watch the film. Rob and the producers graciously provided a link. So let's begin. Our first speaker is the director of African Apocalypse, or well, the director and co-writer, so let me say a little bit more about Rob Lemkin, and, I, and Anne has already introduced him somewhat. He's an Emmy and Sundance award-winning documentary film director. He directed and co-wrote African Apocalypse, one of his other films, Enemies of the People About the Killing Fields of Cambodia, was used extensively at the UN-backed trial of the Khmer Rouge. Apart from some remarks, Rob also plans to show the first of two clips from the film, um, I'm also posting a link to Rob's website in the chat for anyone wishing to learn more about his work. And for those who have not seen the film, I trust that Rob will have some detail about how you can. So Rob will speak for about three minutes. Um, Rob? Thanks very much, Sean. And thank you, Anne. And thank you to the New School for putting on this, uh, this great event. And thank you to all the panelists that are coming on. And I can see they're coming on as we speak, extra people coming on. Amina's just come from Niger. It's now six years since we started working with communities in Niger for the film that turned out to be African Apocalypse. Early on in that process, we came to realize that this was not just about a historical violence colonial invasion, that that invasion was what created the boundaries of the colonial and modern state. But more importantly, that Voulet's mission, as one person says in one of the clips that we will play today, was when people feel, Nigerian people feel, that Niger's poverty began. So it's really about the present, as has been said, and as Professor Salvioli and others will, I'm sure, bring out. Our film still has a long way to go in terms of its active life, but since it is only one part of a much bigger process, 
Uh, when we were alerted to the call for evidence from the Special Rapporteur's Office, the communities in Niger and we, Femi and I, together with our colleagues in France, jumped at the chance to play a part in this important intervention. The first clip that we're going to play now, before Professor Salvioli introduces the themes of his report, includes three groups of people. The first two come from a place called Bernin Kony in southern Niger, the site of one of the most extreme colonial crimes of the French invasion that was led by Voulet. Later, Professor Ibro Abdu, who among many other things is a notable at the court of the Sultan of Bernin Kony, will be contributing to this webinar from Niger. The third group of people in this clip are people who live by the grave of Paul Voulet and his second in command, Shan Wan, in the village of Mai Jirgi. This grave is preserved today, partly in the hope of attracting visitors should tourists ever come back to Niger, but it confronts more importantly, the residents of the town every day with a symbol of an eternal colonial presence, present. Their filmed remarks, which you're going to see in a moment, made at the grave are not surprisingly angry and existential, and also make many important lived links between colonial history and current oppression. Now, Kirill, could you please play clip number one? Kana <laughs> Ya nuna maka abin bakin ciki chiles rayuwar ka taba ci abin ya san babu dadi Bala abu Prince Stuart Mulisa no dan a ramase ga bannar da gule ta yi makwanni da a ce kamar lokaci ne irin na yanzu da su gule an kai su kotun lahe Excuse the cream contre l'humanité un crime qui est resté impuni jusqu'à maintenant. Aïe, ta que est-ce qu'il y a des gens qui sont cachés Aïe, ta série. 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 Kurin <laughs> Babu <laughs> kuma da aka fara din ya dawo di wannan akwai tsoron cikin rai akwai tsoron kullun ana ta kwana kan wannan mutane su sake da rawa
Um, thank you, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Fabian Salvioli, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Promotion of Truth, Justice, Reparation, and Guarantees of Non-Recurrence. Professor Salvioli is a human rights lawyer and professor and has authored several books and articles on international human rights law. He twice served as a member and three times as president of the ad hoc arbitration courts on monetary operations of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And in May, 2018, he was appointed as UN Special Rapporteur, which is why he's here. To our discussion today, Professor Salviola's report notes that, quote, in Niger, no formal truth-seeking initiatives about the colonial past have been established, despite the fact that for generations, affected communities have been conducting informal community-based investigations, unquote. Fabian will speak for about 10 minutes about the content and evidence of his report. He will also speak on the politics of transitional justice. And I'm posting a link of Professor Salvioli's bio um, and the Special Rapporteur's report in the chat. Professor Salvioli. Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers. Um, the film is better than a million of reports. The film itself is better than my report. Femi, I, I've seen you. I traveled with you three times these days. I saw the movie, and it's not a fiction. It's a movie, but not a fiction. Three times with you. I. I experienced in, in my own body the transformation you, you experienced in the, in, across the travel. Amina, je, je voyageais avec toi aussi. J'étais à ton côté. J'étais à ton côté. Ah oui, Et on a voyagé ensemble. Même quand tu as, quand tu as parlé de, de, de ta propre situation. Oh, oh. On so I'm coming from Argentina. I'm, I'm coming also from, from the South. And I asked myself when I saw the, the film, what can I do? What must I do? And the report I made as special rapporteur was in the same line, in the same line, how to address the legacy of the colonialism that is not a problem of history, people is suffering today as the testimonies clearly say. So let me again, first of all, express my deep solidarity, deep solidarity with the victims of Niger, with their relatives. So I have no words to express my solidarity. And uh, also to, to thank the inputs for my report. You presented answers to the questionnaire, and uh, that was very, very useful for me. Um, let me talk about the report and the presentation I did in yesterday here in, in New York. The report looks the design and implementation of measures in the field of trust, trust, truth, justice, reparations, guarantees of non-recurrences and memorialization processes to address the gross violations of human rights and international humanitarian law committed in colonial contexts. As you know, it reviews the relevant legal framework, the challenges, some good practices, 
not too much, unfortunately, but some good practices followed with by the governments and the opportunity in the adoption of measures and offer a recommendation address the community regarding the adoption of measures to address such violations. The recommendation aim at providing guidance regarding the measures that should and must be adopted in those countries in the field of truth seeking, criminal accountability, reparations, remembrance of the past, and institutional and legal reform needed to remove remnants of oppression and discrimination and prevent future violence. The current racial discrimination has a clear link with the past. And Europe must be careful. And Europe must choose between being the Europe of the colonization of the Europe of the human rights. They can't be both at the same time. That is outside of, of, my, of, of, of my paper, but I need to, to, to say that. Um, I emphasize that these recommendations aim at assisting those states in complying with their obligations under international human rights law to address the serious violations committed in colonial contexts. And I highlight that the adoption of appropriate measures in this area to address past violations is not an option, is not optional, is mandatory. The colonial transfers of wealth and racist oppression have created a legacy of social, economic, and cultural exclusion. The effects of which have been felt for generations. And the movie clearly shows that. Unlike classic transitional justice processes, which focus on events in the recent past, addressing human rights violations perpetrated in colonial times and the historical injustices that derive from them presents challenges given the time that has elapsed. Transitional justice mechanisms are uniquely placed place it to address the structural violence and systematic exclusion from the economic, political, and social sphere that characterize colonialism. Through commissions with holistic mandates to address the colonial past and violations of civil, cultural, economic, political, and social rights, and the damage to the environment also. Reparations programs that remedy the structural inequalities suffered by victims and public and clear apologies that restore the dignity. Memorialization and education measures that comprehensively address the patterns, causes, and consequences of rights violations. Warranties on non repetition that change cultural and institutional norms, structures, and processes that perpetuate discrimination, racism, and exclusion. In general, the processes of seeking historical truth, acknowledging the harms perpetrated, and addressing the present repercussions are indispensable to achieving restorative justice as a basis for a real peace. Reparations continue to be essential to address the harm suffered, even decades after the violations took place. The report 
mentions as example the physical and mental consequences suffered by hipsigits and Chalai victims in Kenya during colonial times. The report examines the legacy of human rights violations as well as the direct and indirect consequences of colonialism in two situations. The second situation is former colonies that are now independent states, that it is, of course, the case. In this context, the colonial empire withdrew from the territory, but unequal powers, structures, marginalization of particular ethnic groups and land expropriation continued. As indicated in the report, in these cases, transitional justice measures require a dialogue between the former colonizing power and the former colony, because two states are involved. There are obligations and the expectations to respond to past or ongoing rights violations, which require a commitment of both sides. The duty to provide effective remedies to victims ensure accountability, contribute to truth and memory, facilitate unrestricted access to archives, and provide reparations to victims, including in the form of satisfaction, restitution, compensation, and rehabilitation, are clearly incumbent on the former colonizing power. However, the independent state must also assume some obligations as new state manager. While these obligations do not relate to responsibility to the acts committed by the colonizing power, they do relate to rehabilitation, socioeconomic re reintegration, and ensuring access to justice, education, health, and essential service to the victims, as well as truth seeking and the preservation of memory. In cases where perpetrator who are still alive, remain within the jurisdiction of the independent state, the state also has a duty to ensure accountability with the support of the international community, if necessary. Regarding accountability, it is important to point out that, as indicated in the report, there is no statute of limitation on crimes against humanity and war crimes. I, I was really touched when the, the, the king said in the movie, if these events should be committed today, it will be clearly crimes against humanity and the International Court, Criminal Court should prosecute and punish. We, we need to take clear dimension of what happened. It's a horrible massacre, horrible. The report highlights numerous examples of TJ's measures that government adopted or failed to adopt to adequate address the legacy of colonialism in former colonies. The case I mentioned about Kenya is one of them as is the recent agreement between Germany and Namibia to provide public apologies to the Herero and Nama peoples without the participation of affected communities. That is not acceptable. Regarding memorialization efforts, the report notes with concern the sites and initiatives honoring colonial periods and figures which are still displayed in many former colonial powers and settled states, and also in former colonies. As you know well, in the central square of the village May Girgi, Indonesia, graves are preserved of the French soldiers 
who led the Central African mission in which tens of thousands of people were massacred. In stark contrast with this, they are not memorial to the victims. Again, I was touched with the testimony at the end of the film. These situations are indicative of lack of awareness of the legacy of colonialism and its insufficient inclusion in historical records and educational curricula. It is important to note that memorialization should aim to establish a dialogical truth. That is to create the conditions for a debate within society about a brutal past without justifying it. Thus, easing existing tensions and allowing society to live more peacefully with the legacy of past division without falling into a dangerous relativism or creating an homogeneous truth. However, the process should never result in denial or relativization of the violations committed. In all cases, the voices of the victims must occupy a privileged space in the construction of memory. There is no memory without voice of the victim. We need to avoid the manipulation that can claim from the place of the perpetrator. That is a new revictimization of the victim. To conclude, I would like to underscore that it is essential tenant of transitional justice is that the victim-centered approach must be adopted in all measures aimed to addressing the past violation. It is not acceptable to make victims and affected communities invisible. And one success of the movie is the visibility of the victims during all the movie. Victims must occupy a central and privileged role and actively participate in the design and implementation of transitional justice mechanisms. They will avoid the adoption of cosmetic measures which fail to respond to the needs of victims. And in doing so, it will legitimize the mechanism adopted to address the colonial legacy, allowing a genuine reconciliation based on fairness and justice. I said I started my way with Fanny and with Amina. I want to continue the way. I want to continue working with you and with the victims. I thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Salvioli. That was, that was really, uh, that was very beautiful and brilliant. Um, next, I'm going to ask Rob if he can introduce um, and show the second clip now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Savio. That was amazing. And uh, thank you very much, Sean. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about uh, the next clip is going to really be concerned with the infrastructure and the way that infrastructure, uh, colonial infrastructure, continues into the present day and has such a uh, uh, an effect on the way the world uh, is in a place like Niger and all over the world in the previously colonized world. The colonial infrastructure of the present is ubiquitous, including at the level of state border and migration regimes of finance. For example, in what the West African franc was for, no long, for, for a long time controlled directly by France and it's still closely connected. And at the level of transport and transport is what we're going to be doing in this next clip. The road that was created by Voulet's massacres has been brilliantly written about by two writers and scholars who I believe are present today at tonight's, at this afternoon's webinar, uh, Adeline Maskelier and Peter Chilson. Adeline writes of the survivors of Voulet's massacres being forced out of their hiding places at gunpoint shortly after those massacres to, to hand carry the rocks of laterite used to construct the road. In our second clip, we will see material on the road that was not used in our film. Some of the elders from a place called Dagakar, just near Bernin Connie, 
uh, that we met in the first clip recall in this clip the days of la corvée the system of forced labor in french colonies that was maintained until 1946 in fact all the colonizing powers if we're honest did more or less the same some might say still do but la corvée was uniquely frank in its terms as thomas piketty has recently reminded us in his capital and ideology the international labor organization the ilo accused the French authorities of virtual slavery because of this corvée throughout the 1920s and 30s. The French replied at the time that those that they termed evolved, evolu was the French word that was used, i.e. those who had adopted a European lifestyle could pay a cash fee to avoid la corvée, the forced labor uh, regime. And later they extended this to all so-called natives, again, the, the term that was used by French and British and, and, and all European colonial uh, powers to avoid the charge. The second group that are coming up in this clip are also talking about the road, but they're very young people in Niger, they're school children, and they discuss the meaning of the road to them today. And they offer some, I think, very provocative and interesting thoughts on transitional justice. So Kirill, could you please now play clip number two? What is and that I may come over? Anna Zubakasa, Kajia, Muna Jara, Muna Jara, the nun said the monk of Yaka Dogonduchi. Nigani Quanum are by in. Kajia, Simon Kakuma, Chankuja Kuma, Batin Yaka Dogonduji Kajia, Muna Doku Aga Kwanduna, Muna the Kamuna Zubia, Anna Jara the Kiri, Babu Hiri, the Namunkahala, Ada Kwana Goma Mukai, one Nankamba Abamuko Dala, Kwana Goma, and Kayu Kwana Goma, also to taste of Kongoma. Eh, <laughs> 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 Yakimsu. <laughs> 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 Tu parles aussi du fait qu'ils sont, qu sont satisfaits du lait, car c'est grâce à lui si on a la route nationale, la frontière niger nigérien Mais nous, on ne veut pas de la route. Parce que nos ancêtres ont déjà trouvé un moyen de se communiquer entre eux. Ils peuvent suivre les routes qu'ils ont préparé eux-mêmes pour voir ses frères, même ses grands-parents. Maintenant, il y a même ma soeur, elle est mariée là-bas, mais je ne peux pas la voir parce que cette frontière, ce n'est pas tous les jours qu'on laisse des Nigériens entrer dans le Niger. Donc, je ne suis pas satisfaite. Que les noirs sont des n'ont aucune valeur pour eux. Mais maintenant, on ne peut pas s'évanger contre eux parce qu'on n'a on pas des armes comme eux. On peut s'évanger. Mmh. Allah, il est sans. Même quand tu laisses une personne, tu t'évanges de lui. Um, thank you very much, uh, Rob. Uh, so 
We're going to move to our next um, guest, our next set of guests. We will now have uh, inputs from uh, three Nigerians who are participants in the film. They are Amina Weira, Ibu Abdu, and Husseini Tahiru Amadu. Uh, they will each speak for a few minutes or uh, very shortly. They, uh, they will speak, speak in French and uh, Anne Stola will translate. Uh, so first up, I'm going to start with uh, Amina. Amina Wera is the director of an acclaimed film about the Nigerian uranium industry. She's also one of the central characters in the film uh, African Apocalypse. So I'll start with you, um, Amina, if you could speak first. Um, and Anne, uh, I suppose you will also join, uh, join in. I mean, you can go ahead, yeah. Et, euh, bonsoir, et euh, je suis ravie d'être avec vous. Et euh, je m'appelle Amina Ouera, je suis réalisatrice du Niger. Et je fais partie des personnages de African Apocalypse. Et c'est à moi d'intervenir ou euh, c'est à... Comment il s'appelle l'autre, Alidou? Oui, 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 c'est toi, Amina. Oui, oui. Ah, d'accord, ok, parce que comme okay. j'ai l'impression que je suis euh, toute seule, quoi. <rire> Vas-y. D'accord. <rire> ah, ok, il y en a qui ont désactivé leur vidéo, donc du coup, je ne sais pas comment il faut procéder. D'accord, en fait, euh, moi et euh, la mission voulait et Chanoine, c'était euh, une histoire que je ne connaissais pas euh, avant. C'était une histoire que je connaissais seulement quand j'étais à l'école primaire où on nous a fait juste une petite leçon de, de quelques lignes où on nous a parlé euh, de, de deux colons qui étaient venus euh, coloniser un peu euh, le Niger. Donc, je n'avais pas grande connaissance de, euh, de cette mission-là. Et euh, c'est surtout pendant le tournage de African Apocalypse que j'ai appris pas mal de choses concernant cette mission-là. Et d'ailleurs, en ce qui concerne mes Jirgi, où sont enterrés le capitaine Voulet et Chanois. Et euh, c'était la première fois que je découvrais ces lieux, c'était la première fois que je découvrais les tombes de ces personnages-là. Et en même temps, j'étais euh, très subjuguée et très étonnée de voir la façon dont la population des mes Jirgi était, euh, était scandalisée par rapport à la présence de ces tombes-là dans leur village. Et il y en a qui étaient même prêts à détruire ces, ces tombes-là. Et euh, pour, euh, pour ne plus voir, le fait même de savoir que ces deux couleurs, la sonde de leur village, c'était euh, pour eux un chagrin. Et euh, donc, on avait, pendant le tournage, on a dû s'entretenir avec euh, pas mal de jeunes. Donc, à un moment, moi, je ne savais même pas qu'ils avaient euh, connaissance même des personnes qui sont enterrées dans, 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 dans ces tombes-là. Et j'étais étonnée de voir qu'ils connaissent un peu l'histoire parce que c'est de l'histoire qui est transmise de génération en génération. Et tous ces jeunes-là avaient connaissance de la présence de ces tombes-là. Donc, il y a, normalement, il y a une déclaration que je suis euh, censée lire, Rob. Et, euh, je ne sais pas si euh, c'est le moment de lire la déclaration ou... Il faut attendre plus tard. Rob, is it time to read the declaration or should she wait for a bit? Oui, 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 c'est bon. Oui. 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 Vas-y. Oui. Merci. Euh, je vais me Merci permettre Mille. de parler au nom de la population de Nigeria parce que euh, c'est une population qui, euh, qui garde des mots au fond d'elle. Et euh, comme la population de Nigeria, c'est quand même une population nigérienne et je. Je partage leurs mots et je me permets de lire cette déclaration-là. En tant que communauté, nous aimerons remplacer la tombe par un nouveau mémorial qui expose les crimes coloniaux de Voulet et Chanois. Documenter la crise aiguë des réfugiés qu'ils ont provoqué et le retard du développement de notre ville a connu. Mais il doit aussi célébrer la résilience de notre communauté. Nous aimerions construire un musée qui documente ce qui est arrivé à notre communauté à la suite de la mission Voulez et Chanois. 
C'est pour que les enfants puissent en apprendre davantage sur leur histoire, sur l'histoire de leur pays. Nous pensons que ces initiatives devraient être financées par l'ambassade ou le gouvernement de France ou des ONG. Donc voilà cette petite déclaration en résumé de ce que nous avons et, et, comment on appelle ça, retenu et, de notre passage à Nigeria. Et il y a des micros qui sont coupés, euh, du coup, euh, j'ai du mal à, à me retrouver. <rire> Anne, please, can you, uh, your, your microphone is oh, off. <laughs> okay, thank you, Amina, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not going to say everything that you did, it was really beautifully said, but you did say thank you for having me here, and you did say, I think, that you were a young girl and really didn't know about this. Um, at the time, and were really um, a, a, a sort of astonished, is donné, uh, by how much people were scandalized um, by it. And what was quite amazing is the children actually knew in the village, right? Who was buried there um, and who the grave, um, what the grave was. Um, so, one of the things you said, I'm speaking on behalf, this is really important for the community of my Jogé. As a community, we would like to replace the grave with a new memorial that exposes the colonial crimes of Voule and Chanois, documents the acute refugee crisis they caused and the developmental delay that our city has experienced. But it must also celebrate the resilience of our community. We would like to build a museum that documents what happened in our community as a result of the Vule Chenwa mission. This is so that children can learn more about the history of their own country. We believe that these initiatives should be funded by the French embassy or our government or by NGOs. Thank you for that powerful, powerful intervention. Uh, next, um, thank you, thank you, Amina. Next, we have Ibro Abdu, uh, who is a professor of economics in Niamey, in Niger, uh, and he submitted evidence to the UN Special Rapporteur's report on the legacy of colonial crimes. Um, he will speak next, Ibro. Je vous ai muté, Ibro, et il faut que... Ah, maintenant. Ibro, you're there. Voilà. Uh, C'est bon. C'est bon, c'est bien. Merci. Bon. Ouais. Okay. Alors, euh, dans le cadre de la restauration de la vérité historique s'agissant euh, des faits coloniales, euh, nous avons porté une déclaration euh, qui rappelle des droits naturels inaliénables et sacrés des victimes de la mission voulée chanoine, ainsi que leurs droits et leurs devoirs aux fins de maintenir le bonheur de tous à travers des actes et principes simples et incontestables. De ce fait, nous réclamons alors au nom euh, de la population de Kony, mais également des autres populations qui ont été victimes de la mission de Chanon, et qu'une loi universelle soit élaborée afin de permettre d'aboutir à des réparations accordées aux victimes, les victimes bien sûr de la mission de Chanon, en tandis que la loi n'a le droit de défendre que des actes nuisibles à la société et que tout ce qui n'est pas euh, défendu par la loi ne peut être empêché et nul ne peut être contraint à faire ce qu'elle n'ordonne pas. De ce fait, -là, il y a la nécessité qu'il y ait une loi afin que des enfin qu'on puisse exécuter ce que nous demandons. De ce fait de la loi, nous réclamons alors que la justice soit rendue aux populations de Pony, mais également aux populations des autres espaces où est passée la mission de 
D'autant plus que la loi doit être la même pour tous, soit ce qu'elle protège, soit ce qu'elle punisse. Tous les citoyens étant égaux à ses yeux, ces derniers sont également admissibles à toute dignité et ce, sans autre distinction que celle de leur vertu et de leur talent. Nous réclamons que les vérités historiques sur les faits coloniaux, notamment de la mission boulet chanoine soit rétablie afin que les torts soient reconnus suite à une procédure judiciaire fondée sur la loi dont nous avions fait mention plus haut. Nous réclamons également que les articles, autres documents et autres outils culturels des civilisations autochtones, subtilisés ou abîmés, soient respectivement restitués ou restaurés. Enfin, que la ville de Berlin-Colli, au Niger, où environ 15 000 personnes ont été massacrées en quelques jours, ce qui équivaut aujourd'hui à 450 000 personnes qui s'étaient actualisées, soit déclarée comme principale ville martyre du fait colonial de la mission de l'Ouest-Chanoine au Niger et qu'on y construise alors un mémorial et un musée de la colonisation comprenant une bibliothèque, des archives coloniales et un centre de recherche sur les faits coloniales. Enfin, nous demandons à ce qu'il y ait création d'un fonds de mise en valeur des espaces qui sont ravagés. Nous pensons que ceci participe, n'est-ce pas, à ce que les tensions baissent et que ceci participe, n'est-ce pas, à la réparation de tout ce qui a été fait dans les faits coloniales. Merci. You're muted again, Anne. Unmute. I keep trying to unmute. Thank you so much for that, um, Mr. Abdul. We are going to. Um, I'm going to try to translate some of what you what what you said. You said, following a declaration that we have made, which recalls the natural and alienable and sacred rights of the victims of the colonial fact, as well as their rights and their duties in order to maintain the happiness of all through simple and incontestable acts and principles. We demand on behalf of the Kanawas, people of the Berlin Koni and other victims, and this is really important that, that he emphasized um, other victims of the colonial fact, especially la mission voulez chanon an elaboration of a universal law which could make it possible to lead to reparations granted to the victims of the colonial fact understood that quote the law does not have the right to defend actions harmful to the society and that i quote anything that is not forbidden by the law cannot be prevented and no one can be forced to do what it does not order unquote as a result of the law, we then claim that justice be done to the Kanawas and as well as to all the victims of the colonial fact, especially since the law must be the same for all. Whether it protects or it punishes, all citizens being equal in his eyes, they are not, they are also eligible for all dignities without any distinction other than that of their virtues and their talents that the historical truth on the colonial facts be reestablished so that the wrongs are recognized following a judicial procedure based on the law which we mentioned above. That the articles, other documents, and other cultural tools, tools of indigenous civilizations stolen or damaged be respectfully restored and, um, and or restored. That the town of Bernin Koni in Niger where 15 to 20,000 people were massacred in one day, be declared as the main martyr town of the colonial fact in Niger, and then build there a memorial and a colonization museum, including a library of colonial archives and a colonial fact research center, that we create a fund for the enhancement of devastate, devastated and ravaged spaces. Thank you so much. Finally, uh, as, as part of our three speakers, uh, three Nigerian speakers, although we have more, we have uh, Husseini Tahiru Amadou. Husseini is a secondary school 
teacher of history in Niamey, Niger, and he's also a contributor in African Apocalypse. He also submitted evidence to the UN Special Rapporteur's report on the legacy of colonial crimes. Husseini? Just asking to unmute. Oh, there it is. Good. We up. Hello. Uh, yeah, you are here. You are here. You, you can go ahead. Okay. Vas-y. Bienvenue. Vas-y, Usain. C'est à toi à parler maintenant. Oui, oui, oui. Donc, je vous vois. Donc, je vais euh, essayer de lire ma déclaration. Euh, comme. Euh, Amina et Abdou, je vais lire ce que j'ai préparé comme déclaration par rapport à cette <coughs> activité. Donc, euh, considérant la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme, considérant que la personne humaine est sacrée, considérant les crimes inoubliables et inacceptables perpétrés par Voulé et Chanouane, et sa horde désorientée et brutale. Considérant le peu d'estime et de tolérance affichée par la France vis-à-vis -vis des Noirs. <coughs> Considérant la légèreté avec laquelle la France et le gouvernement nigérien prennent cette affaire de boulet chanoine, réclamons 1. La mise en place d'une commission d'enquête par les Nations Unies pour faire la lumière sur toutes les exactions commises par Boulet et Chanoine pendant la période coloniale. Deux, la mise en accusation, une fois l'enquête terminée de la France devant les juridictions internationales. Trois, les réparations pour toutes les, pour toutes les victimes de Boulet et Chanoine, notamment les populations de Djungu. Quatre, la consécration de la date du 24 février comme date de, co de commémoration des événements survenus à Gungu en février 1899 lors du passage de Boulet. Vive la, les Nations Unies, vive la justice internationale, vive le Niger, justice pour Gungu. Je vous remercie. And we're not hearing you. And okay. we're not there hearing I'm, you. I'm getting, yes, I, I was unmuted by, uh, by a ghost. And now I am, um, I am unmuted again. Um, Hussini, thank you for that. I, I, I know you've changed some of what you said in your, uh, the original declaration, but um, I think it's important for, to, to give s some space for both. Um, that what you are considering here is a crime that is absolutely unacceptable, unacceptable um, in every form and brutal in every form. Um, France was guilty of a crime in Dionzu. Indeed, despite the legendary hospitality of the population and their leader, this did not prevent Boulet from violently repressing this population. Indeed, the tradition, when a foreigner arrives, we inform the chef who sends two young girls bringing two calabashes, one containing milk and the other cola. It is a welcome sign if you are not violent. But Voulet began by murdering the two young girls before opening fire in the village. What I expect from France is the admission of having done harm because it was at home that it happened. They would punish it as a crime against humanity. But as it is here in Africa, and that is a black skin that was killed, they assume that it was nothing, that it could be forgotten and erased. What I want France to do, that they recognize, that they go back and reread what happened, and that they say, okay, we really have done this damage. We had done this damage. If my opinion counts, it is the whole of Niger. It is the government of Niger that should stand up and file a complaint against France at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. 
a new global institution is proposed, the International Tribune for Colonial Crimes, a court with the power to impose sanctions, whether it is reparations in the form of apologies, rewards, or restitution of stolen things. In relation to the commemoration, February 24th of each year can be taken as a public holiday to commemorate the massacre. For example, we can invite the families of Voulet and Shen Wan and organize conferences to show them what Voulet has done. I think the French government should also send a representative every year. I propose that a commemorative installation be built and in other sites across Niger of the massacres of Voulet mission. I think the French government should provide the necessary funds. Long live Niger. I'm trying to I'm trying to not uh, do Amandla signs on the on the uh, Amandla and Gawetu. I'm not sure why I'm allowed to do that. I'm trying to be respectful. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Usena Alidu. Um, she's professor in the Department of African, Middle Eastern, and South Asian Languages and Literature, and Comparative Literature at Rutgers University in New Brunswick and is the director of Rutgers' Center for Women's Global Leadership. Um, and I will post her bio in the chat, uh, Professor Aridu. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Shan Jaffa, for, um, and Professor Ann Stoller, and Professor um, uh, Rob uh, Lemkin, and uh, UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Professor Fabian Salvioli, for um, and also uh, Femi Yan, uh, Yan, uh, Nayanda Amina Were, and all the colleagues, Ibo Abdu, um, uh, Tahiru Husseini, uh, all who have contributed, and Kirill for uh, really uh, this uh, very important and, and timely um, event, uh, looking at uh, um, the place of uh, memory. And I would like memory in a revisiting uh, colonial violence uh, in, in Niger and, uh, and Niger being one of the countries that very often people do not mention, but which has been really the theater of what, um, as a, our colleague, the UN Special Rapporteur and what the film, this uh, really brilliant, brilliant film, a moral film um, that calls for uh, solidarity uh, for the recognition of human dignity and the recognition of what has happened um, historically, but which continues uh, to um, have great bearing um, in our lives uh, in Niger and uh, across the world. So I want to thank you for really uh, giving uh, the opportunity of people of Niger people in the in in Koni, uh, Berni Koni, people in Dogonduchi, people across Niger where the mission Vule Shanwan has uh, uh, operated to have the opportunity today to speak because the world has not heard them and as one of uh, the South African uh, writer Don Matera has said memory is a weapon because memory is not erased here and it is important that it is a convergence of conscious, conscious across world cultures, world civilization, whether you are American or whether you are African and whether you are from Niger or not, but coming together to say from Argentina, uh, coming together to bring this question of what really amount to a genocide, because what Vule Shannon has done uh, the mission of Vule Echan, uh, uh, Vule Echan, uh, amount to a genocide, a genocide that people from Niger, um, from all generation and in families keep because they could not speak because the colonial, colonial colonialism and its onslaught had an afterlife. And the afterlife is what transpire in this brilliant film by uh, Rob and, uh, and Femi and Amina by looking at what is the meaning of the national road. 
the so-called national road, which is really a road that is continuing uh, to, to, to mark itself as the artery of extractive, extractiveness, extractive labor, free labor. So as the memory recall the theft of labor of communities in, at, in the aftermath of the massacre, the theft of labor continues to the post-colonial dispensation, to the current uh, dispensation. And this is where the film, Africa Apocalypse, and Amina Were's film, La Colère dans le Vin, become, they, they are in conversation because La Colère dans le Vin is a contemporary manifestation of the continuing extractive relationship between France and the multinational corporation and, and the liaison with what the, uh, the mission of Voulet et Chanoine have paved a way for this continuation of this extractiveness, of this destruction. So it is an ecological destruction that we are continuing to experience. So there was the massacre of people, which is still continue to, to be the inflicted psychological, physical wound on people marked on the land, where even the people who have been massacred cannot be memorialized. And yet the massacre, the murderers have been memorialized. And this is where the work of Philwin Sar is very important in saying, how do we do restorative justice? How do we repair? So as the work of Professor Fabian Salvioli is recalling, uh, are recalling us, is first is not only to apologize, to recognize, but to repair, to repair the infrastructure, to allow African voices, Nigerian voices to mark themselves. Poverty is manufactured. Gender-based violence has been manufactured. Imagine when more than 300 men, able bodies, have been massacred in one day. You create demographic gender inequalities. You create gender discordance. After that massacre, all the epistemic knowledge production is erased. So when we look at really in terms of reparation, what needs to happen? happen here. It is important that the UN call not only France, but all the multinational corporations that are operating and continuing the project that Voule et Chanoine have opened up into the modern time to look at what is economic vulnerability, what is gender vulnerability, what is the moral consciousness of the people of the world to say enough is enough about the violence inflicted upon African lives, upon Niger and the Sahel region. What is going on contemporarily? The Lake, Lake Chad area, the Sahel, Sahel Sahara Strip, that is the, the theater of Boulet Chanoine, is contemporary the theater of the massacre that is continuing in the Sahel region. So it is very important that uh, uh, Professor Fabian, uh, Prof. Uh, Femi Nayala, and, and uh, the Amina are telling us memory is not only the, about the past. And the local com the community people, I am from Niger, I'm the child of Niger. I am a daughter of people who are from those regions who have been inflicted by this. But more, I'm also the, a daughter of some uh, the other Africans who were brought in, called the Tirayer. So the divide and conquer, putting Africans against Africans after the colonial onslaught has, has destroyed some other parts, whether it is in Guinea or in Mali or in Senegal, and bringing those African youth who have been taken away from their families to come and be the perpetrators of violence against other Africans. This is also another forms of repression that need to be addressed, which is continuing in the post-colonial dispensation and in the present time. 
So I, I want to say that really uh, uh, this, this uh, con uh, conversation between the UN Special Rapporteur uh, uh, report and the documentary film, these are two texts that invite us to revisit how colonial history was, uh, was taught, continue to be taught, and continue to be taught in the absence of African voices. It is very important that the, the young girls, school girls who were invited in the documentary to think of solution. And they said there are two forms of solution. One talk about we do not have the weapon, but the other one says we have the conscious. And this is very critical. It is the moral consciousness of the people of the world to converse whether it's the UN or in any other organization, whether the World Bank that they mentioned in that film, whether in France, whether in diplomacy, in any infrastructure, in educational system, to rewrite history in a way that those historical wounds get healed. Because you cannot have restorative justice unless truth has been addressed and unless the violated has begun space also to self-represent. So this is what this work, this is what this dialogue is about. It is not the only responsibility of people from Niger to claim justice. It is the responsibility as we are doing here collectively as people of the world to say, no, not in our names. And this is why this rendezvous, this dialogue becomes very important. If there is violence in Niger, if there is violence inflicted that continue to impoverish population, it is going to produce the kind of things that the women are saying, we do not want to be vulnerable immigrant refugees at the gates or in the doors of France or Europe, which has already inflicted so much violence on us, so much wounds. We want human dignity so that we are in our place and continue to exercise our humanities in a very dignified way. We do not want to be beggars at the gate of Europe, no other world. We want to be recognized as with human dig dignity. And it is very important to see what the UN Special Rapporteur and Femi and Amina and uh, the Husseini and everybody in Niger and you at the, uh, the new school has done is to say, when we open opportunities for a dialogue, you give the, the voice you see from the elderly people who are still living to the youngest person, they have solutions. They have ideas of what repression can look like if we are all equal and giving opportunity to come sit at the table as equal human beings. So whether it is men or women, whether it is in French or in local indigenous languages, we see that dignity has a human face. So the dignity is that we have to recognize that genocide did happen. We have to recognize that the uh, uh, mission voulait chanoin colonialism what it does, as my colleague and friend says, Nelson Maldonado Torres, colonialism is predicated upon production of death. Death of human being, ecological death, death on land, death flora and fauna, and death in, in, in preventing the possibility for common people to understand that in their name, it is in the name of the French that all this imperial project has taken place. And I'm sure that the common French people, when they have the, we have the responsibility to also let them understand what was done in their name. So I agree with my brother and colleague, the special rapporteur and Femi and uh, Amina and Husseini and Abdu Ibro and uh, Sean and uh, Rob, Rob that this is a moral responsibility for all of us. Europe cannot be dignified unless it changes its ways. 
It's not only Europe, it's the global north. It's the multinational corporations. It's everybody, it's every individual who benefits from this violence to say not in our name. So thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Susanna. Um, we, we have one more speaker and I think we'll have maybe a few minutes left for one or two questions. So our final speaker is uh, Femi Nylander, uh, a poet, activist, and, uh, and who is the co-writer as well as the narrator of the film, African Apocalypse of Femi. Uh, you have the floor and then right after you, I will, I will um, begin by just asking a few questions and we'll have a quick Q&A. Go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. Um, and thank you to the uh, past speakers. Uh, Amina Akwe Lokoti Dayawa Bamu Maganaba, j'espère que tu vas bien avec toi. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, but I'm glad to be here. Um, and um, I'm glad that um, we're having these conversations um, off the back of um, off the back of, of the film. I mean, youth in the diaspora, uh, we often live in and count ourselves as citizens of the very countries, um, very countries that committed atrocities and crimes against our countries of origin. And that puts us in an interesting position in so far as um, in one sense, we're uniquely able to push for restorative justice domestically because we live in the countries that commit these atrocities, uh, but also we, um, we can tie in the historical crimes that were committed on the continent with some of the injustices that happen in the metropoles and um, start to push for this history really to be known um, in the places they're supposed to be known uh, in, in the sense of basically so in Niger, when we went to the school, this history, it, 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 there's the whole scene where the school teacher tells this history. People in Niger know this history. People in Niger, especially in the south of Niger, this history has been enacted on them. But in the global imagination, when you type in Nigerian in um, Microsoft Word, it autocorrects you and says, did you mean Nigerian? Uh, people <laughs> don't, don't, don't barely know that the country exists. Um, never know, never, never mind know that the, um, the actions that France did while they were there and how that has been um, kind of a basis for France's energy policy. Um, if you look at France Afrique in general and um, the hold that France continues to have over um, swathes of West and Central Africa, really this is something which everyone needs to know in the West as well as um, in um, Niger. And also I'm glad to say, um, I saw that in the um, audience we have Arewa 24, we've, we've recently started uh, a, we've, we've partnered with Arewa 24 um, to make sure the film gets um, dubbed into um, Hausa um, and um, make sure that um, it can be um, put out in, um, in, in, in northern Nigeria and in um, southern Niger and in the, the Sahel in general. Uh, so, tout le monde peut, peut le voir. On y... Sorry, I was muted. Was I supposed to be muted? Or was that an accident? I'm assuming it was an accident. Um, so that everyone will be able to see it in um, Niger as well. And this is the plan that pe people can see it everywhere because everyone needs to know this, this history. Um, black lives don't just matter in the UK and in France. Black lives didn't just start to matter um, when George Floyd was killed. They've mattered for a long time. And the black lives that were destroyed by Roulet and um, Shanwan in Niger matter just um, as much as anyone's lives anywhere in the world. And these transnational justice processes, they allow us to have a better understanding of how we got to the world in which we live today with all its injustices and inequalities. Um, I'm very sad to say that one of the minors, um, those who have seen the film, there's two minors um, that are friends of Amina's father. Um, and one of them has died recently. And um, you saw in the film itself, they were talking about how scared they were that they were going to be next because all of their co-workers had died from this exposure to um, this uh, uranium um, which they weren't given protection against and which they weren't um, which they weren't um, told <laughs> basically not even told that it was radioactive and that it could have health consequences um, and so this even up to a few days ago when one of the contributors to our film passed away this history is very very real and is affecting people right now it's not just history it's it's the present um and um 
just hopefully this project will be one of many which will continue to expose these realities um, and hopefully institutions, the UN, uh, any institutions which can, will continue to push for, um, for a recognition of these histories, um, reparation for these histories. And I'm sure you all saw the scene with the school teacher who said, um, you can never repair for the, the life lost. You can never repair for um, the uh, people who were raped. You can never repair for um, the children who had their futures robbed from them. But I mean, there's, there's the fact that you can never repair for it. And there's the fact that there's no effort to repair for it at the moment. And there's not even a recognition and it's still ongoing. And so you can begin to try to repair. And this is where what we need to push for and we need to push for that movement in the right direction. And I'm just very thankful for all the kind comments about the film so far tonight. And um, as I say, hopefully, um, hopefully it's just the start of a process. Uh, Sean, I'd love to just Sean, I'd love <laughs> an ongoing to, part of a process. Uh, in, intervene with one sentence. Uh, Derek Wilcott, uh, a very wonderful Caribbean poet, said, um, "What is uh, colonialism? It is the rot that remains when the men are gone." And ah. that's it. That's it. Uh, um, anyway, thank you very much. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful, but also devastating. Um, I know we don't have much time, so I, one of the things I might want to do, and we should, I'll post, uh, there was a question in the Q&A about where you can find uh, Amina's film, yeah. uh, and we can definitely provide that link also in the chat. I don't know if Amina herself wants to just post it to everybody, if she has a better link. Um, but uh, I have one quick question, which I'm hoping that uh, Professor Salvioli, Rob, Femi, Ibro, Anybody can answer or take it. I know. I mean, this is this might be the next hour, so you have to keep it short. <laughs> I'm just wondering, um, and because I had some other remarks, I'm, I'm not going to make remarks at the end because I, was, I, I think I'm speaking. I was going to say that I'm from South Africa, where they have this vaunted like Truth and Reconciliation Commission that everybody then copied. But if you ask an average Black South African, they'll tell you that that was also that was a very empty process. It was. Mm -hmm. It, 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 was, it was high on emotion, you know, very, it was a public process in which people finally had a chance to make their, their memory public, to, to have some kind of just to, to unburden themselves. Um, but beyond that, it, it, what it did was it turned it into a, uh, it put limits on the time period for which it covered. It didn't even go as far back as in this case, 1899 and the period after it, it stopped mm -hmm. in 1960. It started in 1960 and ended in 1994. And one of the things is when it did finally do, like it had very minimal reparations. My question is really a political one, which is, is there, is there something about this moment? Um, because, you know, it's like to bring this to the front. I mean, it sounds like the people have been talking about this forever. And the film, as Professor Salvioli says, does a lot more than any report can do. So if the film is publicly available and the film has an effect on how people view it and that they react to it. And hopefully this leads to some kind of social movement or social movement action. But is there, is there something different about this moment that could lead to a different kind of result that is not these kind of empty victories when people think of truth and truth commissions and forms of reparations. And I'm saying that because also we are living in the time of Black Lives Matter, Femi referenced it. We are referencing in a time when decolonization is now a sort of, it's, it's in vogue, it's everybody, there just seems to be a sort of a general acceptance that racism is not tolerated in the world anymore. Anybody from footballers uh, to, to cr cricket players, when, and I saw a white South African cricket player did not want to kneel the other day at the World Cricket Championship. But is there something different about this moment that, that uh, France, in this case, the French, the French public, the French government, um, that, that we, will, we will see something in this case that is say different from other truth commissions of other ways in which we have dealt with these kind of violent legacies of colonial states. Anyone of you want to take it? We, we don't have an enormous amount of time. I think we can stick around for like another 10 minutes. So I suppose if you each or some of you would like to answer this question. Um, I think that, um... Yeah, there's always going to be a limit to how much um, there's always the real politic aspect right there's always there's always the fact that the 
the ICC has, has to a degree only ever prosecuted Africans, right? Despite the fact that even today there's some modern war crimes which are carried, being carried out by people who are not. So there's always an element to which, to which um, there's going to be a level of um, a level of pragmatism, and in war politics, it's not just history which is written by the victors; it's the present which is written by the victors. And sometimes things can be seen as um, as as toothless. But as you say, there's progress being made, um, and just the beginning of the recognition of these crimes, even in terms of South Africa, in terms of um, truth and reconciliation, and in terms of the fact that in South Africa you still have some level of what you might call economic apartheid. You still have um, you still have a relation. You still have the cricket team refusing to take the knee. You still have um, townships and this, that, and the rest, right? So it's still an ongoing process, even the apartheid situation, right? This, 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 it's, it's, it's similar insofar as how can reconciliation happen when the process is ongoing? And it is, it is a slow process and it's a too slow a process. But I think that even, as I say, at the moment, even in terms of France, when they talk of colonial history, they're talking more of Algeria. They talk about the Algerian war. There's, you talk about colonial history and you'll talk of the Algerian war. You'll talk of the, there'll be some, I mean, Macron will have to answer to a report on um, the Algerian, and he even came up with his own report, which um, was very, <laughs> very lacking. Um, and it was led by a white French historian. Um, but nonetheless, it's something which is there in the public imagination being discussed. And I think that um, in terms of truth and reconciliation and moving forward, uh, even if there is, aren't, aren't the teeth, we're moving forward and we're, and we're starting to talk about this history in Niger, which has been completely ignored till today and completely kind of sidelined. But I do agree with you um, that sometimes institutions in which certain states are more powerful than other states um, and have more say than other states, um, things can be um, sidetracked or things can even be ignored sometimes. You look at the amount of UN resolutions which have been passed on um, the situation in Palestine is so many, but then in terms of what the Security Council can then veto, it's, it's it sometimes turns out to be a different question in terms of actions. And I do agree with you that um, things need to, there needs to be some bark, to bite to add to the bark. And um, I'm open to hearing from others how, how that bite, bite can be um, ensured. If that makes sense. I, I would Probably. like to open it to uh, Professor Elidu or Professor Salvioli as well. Um, I would just also just maybe say to in answer to your question, Sean, which is maybe the moment is different because I think now there is a kind of connection between people in the global north and the global south, which is becoming stronger. Uh, and the, it's so important for people in the global north, uh, you know, migrant populations and uh, all populations to connect with each other to work together to actually understand what it is that actually is our shared history and to find that actually our shared history has to be something that we have to come to terms with together whoever is in, in, engaged in that and i think that just the the, the nature of the, the way that the demography of the world is changing uh, that it's kind of important and I think as opposed to previous times I think to be honest the world is running out it has to kind of it has to come to terms with these these injustices because it's not something that can be uh, bandaged over anymore there's no other means of doing it so I think the time is coming but we still have to keep working lots of work to do and lots of uh, uh, consciousness raising and activity and everything that everybody can do is 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 uh, is essential but i'd like to pass over to um uh professors uh, alidu and uh, salvioli and anyone else who wants to speak okay uh, thank you so much uh, um professor sean jacob and professor rob uh, lemkin for this the question is really very important and also i agree with uh, uh, rob about the, the ways in which globalization, uh, contemporary globalization, um, um, had um, an unforeseen outcome uh, in the sense that it, it brought people from different um, world, uh, global north and global south, um, into one space. 
and also technology. For instance, this event today, uh, technology has enabled us to, to connect so that the narrative is not only the narrative that, um, uh, 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 that, that is promoted through um, the, the, dom the dominant hegemonic framework, but it's in, uh, the, the possibility of this uh, encounter, global encounter, um, whether it's uh, through the refugees, um, migrants, and, and through the educational uh, uh, se uh, setup, we are having encounters whereby no matter what is the horizon we are coming from, uh, we have been marked by coloniality um, and its afterlife. Um, and the wonderful uh, quote from uh, uh, Derek Walcott's uh, works that uh, Professor Ann Stoller mentioned uh, 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 is very critical. Uh, so the fact that I will be from Niger and then uh, Professor Fabian uh, uh, Salvioli will be from Argentina, uh, you are from South Africa, and uh, Niger and Nigeria, here's Femi and uh, us speaking Hausa, where the coloniality is not expecting uh, somebody who happens to be from Nigeria and, and not uh, uh, what they call ethnically Hausa, to speak Hausa, uh, was not what was framed within the hegemonic dominant colonial framework. And yet here we are. So uh, what I was discussing is that what is going to be different from uh, the truth and reconciliation uh, framework as set up within a dominant framework uh, in the post apartheid uh, system. Uh, it was still very fresh uh, uh, when those post uh, 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 truth and reconciliation framework ha have been set up. And it's still under the uh, uh, watch guard of, uh, of actors, dominant actors who are still invested in a new form of coloniality, even in the post-apartheid system. And we have, seen, uh, we have seen it over and over, not only in the context of South Africa, uh, but we have seen it in, in other contexts um, um, whether it's in Rwanda, how the genocide is interpreted and what happened, how even Cambodia and uh, uh, other places, the Palestinian uh, question. The, the situation now is that the common people are saying not in our names. So racism is not, uh, for me in my teaching, I try and whether I teach myself or my students and the encounters where I present the African condition is to say, even if one is not African, even if one is not of African descent, even if one is not, uh, uh, we have a moral responsibility to understand what is happening to uh, another, uh, another community, another, uh, another world, which is our own world. Yeah. So, so this is possible because this uh, uh, challenge, challenging neocolonialism in a global, globalized form has enabled this possibility of a dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. So it's my turn, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, one of my main battles in UN different states is to put on the table that this is not political wills. These are international human rights obligations, international human rights duties. And it's it's a little bit difficult because when the processes in South Africa started, the political willingness cover all. And it was interesting, but the result was impunity. And impunity is not acceptable. So for complex violations, there, there are not easy solutions. So these five pillars 
truth, with real commission of truth, with the resources in terms of human resources, people specializing in gender based violence, for instance, for instance, no? uh, and material resources with enough time creating trust with victims, looking for the victims, going to the, to the, to the rural areas. This is it's a very difficult job. But it's not just one job. Second, accountability, justice. Justice. How is possible that minor felonies are prosecuted, punished, and the most serious crimes rest in punity, which is the message for the society. So there's no possibility of impunity for this kind of crime. But accountability is not enough. <laughs> reparations, full, full reparations. Apologies, but sincere apologies, not, not for the camera not asking apologies on Monday and going back on Tuesday. That is, that is a re-victimization. And we have, unfortunately, a lot of examples in the world. Apologies, compensation, economic compensation, but institutional reform for the consequences, as we saw in, 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 in the film. But Consequences are today, today, and memorialization processes. Memorialization processes is a package. If you don't have one of these elements, the process fails. The process fails. You can see in Spain people asking justice for the civil war. You can see the Armenian situation. Even if the time pass, passes, the situation will be present because the generations will have in their shoulders the situation. And enough is enough, as said my dear friend, how we can reduce the possibility of committing mistakes. I don't know, but perhaps asking the victims, asking the victims and listen to the victims. Thank you so much for that, um, Fabian. That was really, really important final, final comment. I think one thing we've come all out of this is, you know, these years of apology really are, are meaningless. We're really talking about the material, substantive ways, and it's and it's not just returning a piece of art. It is about the possibilities that a future generation can have and the ways in which history matters so much to politics. The fact that that's been so much not part of the story and it's becoming so much more now. This is the opening of a conversation. This is the opening of another kind of conversation um, that really needs to be had among so many of us together. So um, I just wanted to thank all of you for this really enormous set of contributions. And to let people know in the audience, as well as those who are in the panel, that this is the first part of this three film series. The second film is called um, Meeting the Man, um, James Baldwin in Paris, which is a kind of visceral attack on racism uh, by Baldwin and against the filmmakers. <laughs> and the third, that one is in December, 
And in April, the final film, which is also extraordinary, is Rediscovering Fanon and the relationship between Fanon and racial violence today. And that will be in April. So please join us again. And thank you, Rob, for this extraordinary opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, and thank, well, thank you. you. And thank you, Femi. Thank, thank you, all of you. Thank Merci you, à everybody. Tout. Thank you. Yeah. Merci à tout le monde. Mungode. Mungode. Thank you again. Amina. Mungode. Merci, Femi. Mungode. Mungode. Sanunko. Sanunko. Merci à tout le monde.